You heard me say yesterday, and many of you have heard me talk about the nature of Christ in, in previous years. I am not going to go through why I believe in the nature of Christ, the evidences. I am going to address the question of why I believe it is important, why it is significant. Because you see, about um, maybe 10 years ago now, the Biblical Research Institute of the General Conference sent this out to all of the workers in the North American Division. The World Church has never viewed these subjects, the nature of Christ and the nature of sin, as essential to salvation or to the mission of the remnant church. There can be no strong unity within the World Church of God's remnant people so long as segments who hold these views vocalize and agitate them both in North America and in overseas divisions. These topics need to be laid aside and not urged upon our people as necessary issues. As I read this counsel, I had to wrestle with this issue because I believe in following counsel. I do not believe in defiance. And at times it is a very, very difficult thing to decide where we can agree, where we can move together, and where we cannot. Where are the lines of demarcation? And as, I ha as you obviously know, I still speak on these issues during these past years. And I'm going to share with you this morning briefly my reason for doing that and disregarding the counsel that our brethren have suggested on this particular issue. And then you have to decide for yourself what your position will be. The basic issue in the great controversy that Satan began with is to challenge God's law. God's law, he said, was unfair. It was unjust. It was arbitrary. And if God's law was arbitrary, then God's government was not right. And if God's government was not right, then his character was flawed. All leading from point to point to the, fact, to the reality that God should not be on the throne of the universe. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, let's find out what he primarily came to do. Sometimes we don't understand fully what he came to do. Would you turn to John, John chapter 8, verse 26. John 8, 26. Most of the time, we think of Jesus coming to this world on a rescue mission. That he came to save lost souls and restore them to eternal life. And that is absolutely true. But is there something else? John 8, verse 26. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. What was Christ's primary mission to come as he came down to this earth? He that sent me is true. If that isn't established, no one gets saved. No redemption happens. No lost souls go to heaven. No matter what Christ does during his life and on the cross of Calvary, if that sentence cannot be demonstrated, nothing else works. And so this is the primary purpose of Christ's incarnation, to show that he that sent me is true. And Jesus said, when I speak to you, I speak of what he has told me. I have not come up with this on my own, because I am only his representative on this earth. That's what Jesus is saying to us. And so the primary mission of Jesus Christ is to demonstrate to a universe that God is true and his government is right. Turn to John chapter 14, verse 10. John chapter 14, verse 10. Here he is speaking to Philip. And he says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. You see my miracles? You hear my parables? It is the Father. If the Father were here, he'd say the same thing. He'd do the same thing. 
When you look at me, you are looking at the one who rules the universe. Judge him by me. That's what Jesus is saying. And that is Jesus' primary mission as he comes down to this earth to redeem mankind. He is coming primarily to tell the truth about the character of God. A statement from Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, is very revealing here. He came to the world that the erroneous ideas Satan had been the means of creating in the minds of men in regard to the character of God might be removed. Jesus came to teach men of the Father. When the object of his mission was attained, the revelation of God to the world, notice, that is his mission, the revelation of God to the world. When that is attained, when that was attained, the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. When he fully revealed the character of his Father, his work was accomplished. Because then men could be saved, human beings could be saved. That was a byproduct, you see, of his mission, which was to tell the world and the universe the truth about the character of God. All right, bottom line then. What Jesus does, how he lives, is to prove Satan a liar in the great controversy. That Satan's charges against the character of God are false. How does Christ do that? How can he prove that Satan is lying about the character of God? I have put two letters here on the board. I call them charge A and charge B. There are two charges that Satan makes against the law of God. The first one is he says that unfallen beings, unfallen angels cannot keep, do not need to keep. It is not relevant for them to keep. They have minds. They can think for themselves. Adam and Eve, how, do, how can they, why do they need the law of God? God created them in, their own, in his image. They can think for themselves. They can look at that tree and make a good decision. Unfallen beings do not need the law of God. It is not good for them. It is not what is well, well suited to unfallen beings. That's charge A. Charge B. Everyone understands that one, by the way. That is, there's not much controversy on that. Charge B is the one that most, even many Adventists, do not understand. And that charge is that fallen human beings cannot obey the law of God. Because that is so misunderstood, I want to take a minute or two to share with you the evidence on this point. Does Satan really make this charge, which I've listed as charge B? Listen carefully. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 136. Satan, the fallen angel, had declared that no man could keep the law of God after the disobedience of Adam. Is that unfallen or fallen people? Clearly fallen, isn't it? No man could keep the law after the disobedience of Adam. He claimed the whole race under his control. Signs of the Times, volume 3, page 264. Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God, and thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. If they, sons and daughters, you and me, could not keep the law, then there was fault with the lawgiver. Jesus humbled himself, clothing his divinity with humanity, in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family, and by both precept and example condemn sin in the flesh and give the lie to Satan's charges. Satan's charge? Sons and daughters of Adam could not obey. Jesus came to prove that a lie. Review and Herald, Volume 5, page 120. He came to this world to be tempted in all points as we are, to prove to the universe that in this world of sin, human beings can live lives that God will approve. Satan declared that human beings could not live without sin. What human beings? In this world of sin. Satan said, you and me, human beings cannot live without sin. Jesus came to show that that is false. A couple of other statements. Selected Messages, Volume 1, 252 and 253. After the fall of man, Satan declared that human beings were proved to be incapable of keeping the law of God. One more, 
again from Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 255 and 256. Christ's humanity would demonstrate for eternal ages the question which settled the controversy. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. How did he answer the charge? He took upon his nature, our fallen nature. And then, My Life Today, a Morning Watch devotional book, page 323. Part of his mission in coming to this earth was to prove to the heavenly universe, to Satan, and to all the fallen sons and daughters of Adam at, that through his grace, humanity can keep the law of God. Desire of Ages 26, through Christ's redeeming word, the government of God stands justified. Satan's charges are refuted. Clear evidence, isn't it? Charge B is a very real charge. Satan says fallen human beings cannot obey the law of God. Christ comes to prove Satan a liar. Now let's ask some questions. How can Christ accomplish his redemptive work? How can Christ accomplish his proof that Satan has been lying about God? You see, only by proving Satan wrong can Jesus be our substitute. Only by proving Satan wrong can he be our mediator. Only then does he have a legal right to stand in man's place if he proves that Satan was wrong. If he does not prove that Satan is wrong, Satan wins the great controversy. And no death on the cross will do any good. Primary mission, proving that Satan is wrong in the great controversy. And now the answers come easily. If Jesus Christ took an unfallen nature what charge would he prove Satan to be lying in? Charge A. Unfallen beings cannot obey the law of God. They don't need it. If Jesus would have come in unfallen nature, he would have proved charge A wrong, absolutely, with no question. He would have shown that angels in heaven and Adam and Eve, as they stood in their innocence in Eden, could easily obey the law of God. He would have refuted charge A. Now. If Jesus took a nature partly like Adam and partly like you, remember as we talked about yesterday, taking the innocent infirmities but not the tendencies of the lower nature. If he took part of Adam's nature and part of my nature, what would he then prove? That someone who is part like Adam and part like me can obey the law of God who exists in that category? No one. Only if Jesus takes a fallen nature and proves that in a fallen nature obedience to the law of God is possible does he prove that Satan was lying when he said sons and daughters of Adam cannot keep the law of God. Because you see no one else has disproved him. You and I have not disproved him. Not even Enoch, because Enoch sinned many times before he had to be, before he came to his victory over all sin. John the Baptist sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So the only one who has ever proved that Satan was lying in charge B, fallen human beings cannot obey the law of God, was Jesus Christ, and only if he came in our fallen nature. Only if he came in our fallen nature. If Christ had ex sidestepped the ugliness of our nature and had been given a special dispensation to be different than us, then who in this world has proved Satan wrong? And then the question comes, are we any closer to the end of the great controversy today in 2000 than we were in, when Jesus died on the cross? And the answer is no. We have no Redeemer then. We have no substitute who can stand in our place. We have no legal representative in the courts of heaven to show that Satan was a liar. There is no redemption. That's why this subject is much bigger than most of us realize. Because here we're not talking about example. We're not talking about Jesus showing us how to live. We're talking about whether Jesus can be our substitute and legal representative in the courts of heaven. Can he really be the second Adam? You see, when the first Adam sinned, dominion was given to Satan. 
Satan ruled this world. How only could that dominion be taken away? Not by you and me, not by Job, not by Enoch or Elijah. The dominion could only be taken away by the Son of God. And that dominion could only be wrested from Satan's hands if he proved that Satan was lying in the great controversy. Not just in half of what Satan said, but in all of what Satan said. And that's why this subject becomes of crucial importance for Jesus as our substitute, not just Jesus, our example. Most often it's said those who believe in the fallen nature emphasize the example of Jesus. Those who believe in the unfallen nature emphasize the substitutionary role of Jesus. That's false. This fallen nature is critical to Jesus' substitutionary role to take my place and to take the world back from Satan. And that's part of the reason that I hold to this view. In other words, what I'm saying is that Jesus taking a fallen nature was absolutely essential to his work of demonstrating that Satan was wrong and God was right in the great controversy. It was not an option. It was absolutely essential. Came across a letter from a person in Australia that said something very pertinent to this point. Along with two-thirds of the original number of angels, despite Satan's fiercest attempts to, to tempt and deceive them, despite their having only a partial knowledge of the nature and results of sin, not a single being in the many other inhabited worlds has yielded to sin and lost his right to eternal life. Now consider that for a moment. Satan used his best efforts to take the whole angel angelic force with him. Two-thirds said no. A whole fall, unfallen universe said no to Satan. So Satan tried his hardest, but he failed with most of the unfallen beings that God created. If the Son of the Most High God had taken on human flesh just to prove that sinless beings with sinless natures can perfectly keep God's law, we would have had an infinite humiliation to prove the already and obviously proven. Consider that. A whole universe of beings has proved that unfallen beings can perfectly obey God's law. How would Jesus need to prove that over again? There could have been no greater, more costly, more tragic exercise in futility. Satan's claim is that God is a tyrant so that fallen angels and fallen human beings are irredeemable. What Jesus had to prove was that sin is the real tyrant, that God's law is holy, just, and good, that sinners can repent, sinners can be forgiven, sinners can be justified, sinners can again live in harmony with the principles of his law and occupy a position of dignity and self-respect. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection proved all that for time and eternity. I thought that was a very insightful letter. Did Jesus come to prove what had already been proven? Of course not. He came to prove what no one had proved before. And that's why he suffered and died for us. Now, there is a second part to this. That is the substitutionary part of why Christ took our nature. There is another aspect of this as well. Take your Bible and read with me. Revelation chapter 14, verse 5. Describing the group known as the 144,000, verse 5 is the succinct summary of their character. And in their mouth was found no guile, no deception, no hypocrisy, for they are without fault before the throne of God. There is the succinct description of the character of the last generation who will live on this earth. One individual over 30 years ago astutely observed, those who teach that Christ took a superior human nature draw the logical conclusion that it is impossible for the rest of mankind, the fallen ones, to perfectly obey the law of Jehovah in this life. You see, we're again back to this issue of which charge did Christ refute? If he refuted charge A, what would he have proved for the last generation? That they could successfully obey God 
when they have the same nature as unfallen man. If Christ proved that unfallen nature could obey God's law and unfallen man could obey, then when would the 144,000 be able to demonstrate that? At glorification, second coming, when they receive a perfect nature. That would be proof that the 144,000 could live perfect lives the moment they received the same unfallen nature that Adam had and that Christ had, if he took an unfallen nature. But is that what we read about in Revelation 14, verse 5, that at the second coming of Christ, the 144,000 become perfect? Not it, is it? Only if he takes a fallen nature can he prove to a hoping and watching race on this earth that there is a possibility of living a perfect life at or before the close of probation. And of course, as you are aware, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, to my knowledge, is the only group that teaches a close of probation before the second coming of Christ. And only if Christ takes a fallen nature does that become a crystal clear option. Otherwise, it's a shot in the dark. Will they be able to live perfect lives? Who has proved that? Who has shown that anybody could live a perfect life in a fallen nature? Jesus didn't have a fallen nature, so no one has proved it. So the only way that it is more than a theoretical possibility for a close of probation and the 144,000 living perfect lives is if Jesus took a fallen nature and proved that people at the end of time with fallen natures can perfectly obey his law, a whole generation of them. We're changing it, you see, from a theoretical possibility to a concrete life, flesh and blood reality. Jesus lived in perfect obedience. The 144,000 are given the assurance that it is within God's power to do so in their lives also. There it becomes a practical reality that we can put our hands onto in faith and say the impossible. Does it feel impossible to you? It does to me. To live a sinless life in sinful flesh? to put our hands on the impossible dream and say there is the hot concrete flesh and blood evidence that he can do that in my life as well I will believe it by faith and so I'm going to suggest that there is a critical issue as well review and herald volume 4 page 293 God requires of man nothing that is impossible for him to do Christ kept the law proving beyond controversy that man also can keep it isn't that marvelous? What man? Adam and Eve man? You and me. You and me. Christ kept the law proving that you and I can keep that law. And then this amazing statement in Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 929. In our conclusions, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that it is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. That is an incredible statement. Let me ask you a question. Is having an unfallen nature a tremendous power against evil, sin, temptation, and Satan? No pulls from within? No urges from within to follow wrong leadings? nothing coming from within to respond to outward temptations anymore I'd say that's a tremendous power and that will be our power for all eternity there will be nothing coming from within to lose our temper anymore no impulses to be dis discouraged anymore nothing coming from within to pull us in the wrong direction what a tremendous power that is and notice the statement here when we give to his human nature a power that it is not possible to, for us, for man to have, this power is un, impossible for us to have until glorification. We destroy the completeness of his humanity. Have we in the Seventh-day Adventist Church followed the lead of most Christian churches in destroying Christ's incarnation? Are we asking uh, our believers to be silent about the only issue that can defeat Satan in the great controversy. Somehow, 
light has become darkness and darkness has become light. And so I'll summarize simply by saying that the human nature of Christ is very essential, not non-essential, to understanding the vindication of God's law and his character. And it is essential to Christ taking our place as our substitute. The human nature of Christ is very essential to the final demonstration in sinful flesh, our sinful flesh, that God's law can be kept when Satan says, I have a whole world that says no. Is it essential? I believe it is. I believe we cannot, cannot be silent on this issue, even though we are counseled to do so, because to be silent would be for Satan to win the great controversy. That's why I believe that we must continue to agitate the subject. A couple of things that you might find of some interest as we kind of conclude this uh, series. This is really the, the bottom line of what I want to say. The rest is just going to be some things that you might be interested in. Donald Short wrote a book recently called Made Like His Brethren. Listen to what he had to say. The offense taken at the biblical account of the Christ who was made like unto his brethren continues to be a stumbling block, doesn't it? It continues to be a stumbling block. Present solemn reality suggests that the ancient rejection of the chief cornerstone finds a parallel today in the church as many deny that the word was made flesh. You know that we do that? The word flesh in the New Testament means fallen humanity. The flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. That's fallen humanity. Flesh means fallen humanity. The question for the church to face today is when will Laodicea understand? Can she perceive how she has been shorn and stands naked? Can we with Samson learn from our own history? By consorting with the Philistines, we too have had the seven locks of truth shaved off our heads and so lost our mission. Compromise after compromise has been made. Now we are being told we can shake ourselves and find strength apart from the truth that has sustained and made us a people throughout our history. We are told that such things as understanding the nature of Christ and righteousness by faith in an end time setting are not essential to salvation nor for the mission of the church. We are falsely assured that the world church has never viewed these subjects as central and they should be laid aside for these are matters that Satan would use to take advantage of God's people. Are we like Samson, he is asking, trying to rise up in our own strength and carry the mission of God forward in the world rather than doing it by God's power in God's way. Another book has been written a few years ago on the nature of Christ by Roy Adams. In his book he said, my thesis throughout is that the theology of these three men, A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagoner, and M.L. Andreasen, has provided the spawning ground for the position on righteousness by faith and perfection held by certain Adventists today. Without a doubt, the roots of the present agitation go all the way back to Jones and Wagoner. I found that fascinating, that paragraph. Number one, it's a clear admission that this is what was taught in the 1888 message. This was part of the message of Jones and Wagoner to prepare a people for translation in their time. It didn't come up in recent times. This is old time Adventist truth. And second, obviously it is open opposition to the 1888 message, the message of Jones and Wagoner that Roy Adams is stating in his book. Ralph Larson produced a nice response to this book. I'm going to share a couple of items from his response. By the end of the year 1898, other church leaders had published their own views on the nature of Christ, not different from hers, Ellen White, a total of 76 times. Jones and Wagoner, far from being innovators or teachers of new doctrines, were actually standing firmly in the mainstream of Seventh-day Adventist theology regarding the nature of Christ and character perfection. Their teachings were emphatically not the root of those doctrines, they were rather the fruit, referring to Jones and Wagoner. Adams has apparently arbitrarily selected two persons, Jones and Wagoner, from among a large group of Adventist thought leaders, including Ellen White, 
and assigned to them the responsibility for creating doctrinal attitudes that were actually shared by them all. Was M. L. Andreasen a person who accepted strange and new doctrines from Jones and Wagoner and urged them upon the church, or was he only one among a host of witnesses to generally accept these truths? And Elder Larson concludes, we did not find a single evidence that any of our leaders or believers held a different view from the mainstream on either the nature of Christ or character perfection until the 1900s, not until the mid-1900s, not one. Another reaction to Roy Adams' book came from a different source. This was in um, 1994. It came from a magazine called Good News Unlimited. Does that ring a bell? That was Desmond Ford's publication from Auburn, California. And Desmond Ford responded to Roy Adams' book as well. Listen to his response. At last, after a century and a half, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has published a book devoted entirely to the vital subject of the sinless nature of Christ, our Lord and Savior, the unfallen nature. The denomination's publishing houses have hesitated to proclaim that truth in any publication of scholarly responses. I recommend Roy Adams' book wholeheartedly. Roy Adams' The Nature of Christ is, as far as I know, a first in Adventist publications. It is the first official SDA book to affirm the sinless nature of Christ, our Lord and Savior. What an interesting statement right there. A clear admission from his perspective that Roy Adams is breaking new ground in Adventism, even in 1994 in stating that Jesus Christ took our unfallen nature. That was an interesting analysis that he made of Roy Adams' book as well. You see where the endorsements are coming from. Analyze that very carefully as you make your decisions about what is true and what is false on this subject. Now I'm going to share with you just a little tidbit, something interesting that I bet you didn't know because I taught with Desmond Ford and I didn't know this. And I only found it out when he, made, when he uh, wrote this book review in 1994. Dr. Adams, he disagrees with Dr. Adams on one point. Dr. Adams takes the popular Adventist view found in Ellen White's writings that the destiny of the human race hung in the balance when Christ came to earth. There was, according to Adams, no absolute certainty that Christ would overcome and conquer and successfully complete the atonement. In other words, Christ could have sin. That's what Roy Adams said in his book. The salvation of the human race did not hang in the balance when Christ came. Success was absolutely certain. What is he saying? Not only that Christ did not sin, but that Christ could not sin. Could not sin. I didn't know he taught that. I didn't know he believed that. He'd never said it at Pacific Union College in my hearing. But apparently that's exactly what he believes on this subject. And you know where this comes from? Here is a Protestant theological book on this subject. The possibility of Jesus sinning and falling is an atrocious idea. For then God himself must have been able to sin, which it is blasphemy to think. The idea that Jesus could actually come to this earth and be in jeopardy of sinning is to most Christians blasphemy. Because Jesus is God. God cannot be tempted. God cannot sin. And if Jesus is God, he is incapable of sinning. And of course, then he has to have an unfallen nature because he brings that with him from heaven. Not only an unfallen nature, but a deified nature. A nature like he had for all eternity, which is more than a human nature, obviously. And at that point, Jesus could not have sinned. We're right back to predestination there. The doctrine of predestination, of course, teaches that you and I are predetermined before we are born as to salvation or loss. 
And it includes the idea that when Jesus came, it was predestined that he would succeed. He could not fail. Where then is the incarnation of Christ? How could Satan be proved a liar if that's true? Satan would say, you stack the deck. It is impossible for me to even attempt him. Why bring three great temptations in the wilderness when Satan knows that Jesus Christ couldn't yield to them? What a waste of energy. Is Satan the dumbest person that has ever lived? Why even try? Why not go forth to the rest of the universe and say, look, God is, the test that God has set up is a, is a farce. He isn't allowing choice to operate at all. He won't let me at the only one that he says can deliver the human race. I can't even tempt him. He is untemptable. And that is the bottom line of the conservative Christian world on the nature of Christ that has seeped into our thinking. And although not all Seventh-day Adventist scholars who believe in the unfallen nature accept that, those two things are linked together. That's where it came from. The idea that Jesus could not sin, he could not fall. Either Jesus could not sin, either he could not sin, or he could sin, but did not come into the world just like us. That's what we're saying. Some of our scholars say he could not sin, like Desmond Ford. Most of our scholars say he could sin, but he really took an unfallen nature. And so it was unlikely, you see, that he would sin in that nature. He was shielded and exempted from our temptations. I thought you might find that interesting. The reason that this subject is urged upon our people as unnecessary is not necessarily because it is false but our brethren believe that it is divisive and therefore they urge us not to talk about it you know divisive is all in the eye of the beholder isn't it let me read something from Hank Hanegraaff I read from him yesterday a radio speaker following in the line of Martin and Barnhouse and Kenneth Samples Christians are no more required to make Sunday their day of rest than they are to make Saturday their day of rest. However, of course, they are perfectly free to do so. In fact, to criticize Sunday observance and then to separate from the rest of the church over something like this is both legalistic and divisive. What is divisive? Isn't it always in the eye of the beholder? As to what doctrine, what truth, what teaching is unnecessarily divisive and should be laid aside. Our brother Hanegraaff says, let's lay aside this Sabbath because we all are brothers in Christ. And let's not divide the church over this. We need to come into unity, not splintering the body of Christ over something as unnecessary as Sabbath observance. That's our brother Hanegraaff's counsel. And our brethren's counsel on the nature of Christ is exactly the same thing, isn't it? Let's not divide our church over something so unnecessary as the fallen nature of Jesus Christ. And I say that when God speaks, nothing is unnecessary. Whether it's the Sabbath, or the state of man in death, or 1844, or no secret rapture, or the fallen nature of Christ, if God speaks, it is worth being divisive over because Jesus said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. Brothers and sisters, we've got to make a decision. Follow counsel. I love to follow counsel as far as I can or to say this is an area where misguided counsel is being given to us. You make your decision. Well, we've talked this weekend about being a Seventh-day Adventist. What is unique about Adventism? We've hit a few things, haven't we? There are a whole bunch of areas that are totally unique to Seventh-day Adventism. Most of them are the areas we don't think about. We think about the state of man and death and the Sabbath and all of that. I haven't talked about that at all. I have talked about our, our gospel of salvation, righteousness by faith. And folks, that is what is unique to Adventism. The others are fruits of that uniqueness, the doctrines we hold. But the heart and soul of our uniqueness is Jesus Christ and salvation by faith. 
the heart and soul of the uniqueness of the Adventist message. And I am going to make an appeal to each one of us today to review again in our own thinking why we are Seventh-day Adventists. How much we are like the churches and the Christians around us and where we must differ from them and bring them to a better understanding. Yes, let's join with them on all aspects of truth where they are following truth. But where they are deceived and Satan is going to destroy them at the end of time, we must in love and mercy draw them to a better way. In love, so they do not receive the seven last plagues. And so, brothers and sisters, I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist today. I know that gets labeled. Ultra-traditional are some words. Ultra-conservative, divisive, legalistic, fanatical. Folks, don't worry if someone calls you a fanatic. Just don't be one. <laughs> don't be one, brothers and sisters. It is easy to get fanatical about truth and take it too far. Don't worry if they call you a fanatic. Just don't be one.